All right, I think we're live. So welcome everyone to the MAPS Canada webinar series. My name is Shannon Smadella and I'm your host for the series, as well as a passionate volunteer for MAPS Canada. We are extremely excited to be starting off our webinar series with Mark Hayden, Map, MAPS Canada's own Mark Hayden. Throughout the next few months, we have an amazing selection of speakers, luminaries, scientists, doctors, visionaries lined up for you. And we've gathered some of the best in the field, 13 to be exact, to share important information and their take on the psychedelic renaissance. So for those of you who are joining us who are not familiar with MAPS, I'm happy to share with you a brief introduction. MAPS Canada, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, is a registered charitable nonprofit Canadian organization and is an affiliate organization of the original MAPS based out of Santa Cruz, California, which was founded in 1986. MAPS Canada furthers its mission by providing evidence-based, honest public education about the risks and benefits of psychedelics, supporting scientific research into many aspects of psychedelics, including treatments for medical conditions, neuroscience, creativity, and spirituality, planning, conducting, and publishing scientific research of psychedelic medicines, developing psychedelics into prescription medicines, training psychedelic psychotherapists and working to establish a network of treatment centers that can provide this service in the context of professional best practices. For more information on MAPS, you can visit the website at mapscanada.org. So the funds raised from this webinar series will go to fund research associated with various studies that are on the agenda for MAPS Canada. These studies include an eating order study, Phase one has been funded and we now need more support to bring psychedelic treatments to those suffering from eating disorders. Cognitive processing therapy for PTSD. There are two separate studies that will be looking at individual and couples therapy. And Ibogaine treatments. Ibogaine has demonstrated incredible effectiveness at treating things like opiate addictions, MAPS would like to bring attention to this medicine and fund studies focused on the efficacy and safety of Iowagain use. So some housekeeping items for the webinar. As you can see at the bottom, we have an ask question tab. So questions that you will want to submit will be down in that tab, not in the chat. The webinar will be approximately an hour and a half, and we will be taking a short break just following Mark Hayden's talk. And as you notice, you can also vote up questions in the ask a question box. So please feel free to vote up the questions as we will be prioritizing those questions. After the Q&A, we will be hearing from politician Paul Manley, and then we will close the session with a few updates. So without any further ado, I would like to bring in MAPS Canada Director Mark Hayden. So Mark Hayden is the Executive Director of MAPS Canada and as well an adjunct professor at the University of British Columbia School of Population and Public Health. He has been published on the issue of drug policy for several decades and has been involved in the Health Officers Council of BC articulating post-prohibition models of regulation and control of legal drugs using public health frameworks. Mark is the parent of two children and is an active member of the Vancouver Outdoor Recreation Community. So here is your very own Mark Hayden. Why, thank you, Shannon. So actually, wonderful introduction. I really appreciate that. Um, sounds like a guy I'd like to meet. Um, but really what I'd like to do is tell you folks about Shannon because MAPS Canada is not an individual or a couple of individuals. MAPS Canada is a community. MAPS Canada is a community of organize, a community of people that show up and help because we all have the shared vision of legalizing psychedelics. And Shannon is a really good example of one of the fabulous people that's shown up and offers us a huge amount. Shannon comes with an enormous history of organizing events and is meticulous, organized detail and a fearless leader. And her role in the world of MAPS Canada is noticed and appreciated. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Shannon. 
Thank you, Mark. You're welcome. So what I'm going to propose is that I fiddle for a second and pull up a screen of a PowerPoint and actually walk through a presentation that'll take me, I don't know, 20, 25 minutes, and then just throw it open for questions. And we spend most of our time just having a conversation. I want to kind of throw out some ideas first, just to get us all on the same page. But then um, mostly what we're going to do here is going to chat. So in order to do that, what I have to do is share my screen. I'm going to share this one. And then I'm going to go into here. I think that worked. Shannon, can you let me know? Do you see one slide? We okay. have one slide up there, Mark. Perfect. OK, so let's just kind of walk through this. So I'm going to start at the beginning because we talk about the word psychedelics. In fact, the word psychedelics appears in the title of this talk. And we are the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies. So why are we using the word psychedelics? Because we actually, we had a lot of choices. So the research community generally has agreed it's the right word to use. The first word that was used to describe psychedelics was psychomimetic, which means like psychosis that was used in the 50s. And then the word hallucinogen came along because often people see things that are not there. And um, that means creating visions. And so that's also a word that's used. Empathogen is a word that's used. And that means cre increasing empathy and connection between others. And entheogen is a word that is used. And that kind of gives a deep bow at the waist to the indigenous communities that have used psychedelics for centuries to manifest a sense of spirituality. Now, empathogen and entheogen are positively weighted. Psychomimetic and hallucinogen are negatively weighted. And psychedelic is the most neutral term, and it actually is the most accurate, because what psychedelic means is manifesting of the mind. And what happens during a psychedelic experience is often, if well skillfully guided, people have access to unconscious material in their and access to a larger sense of themselves and their connection to the universe and their connection to others. So psychedelic actually works as a word for us. We, we understand that there's baggage associated with it, you know, the psychedelic art and psychedelic culture and all of that. And, and it's irrelevant to us. Essentially, we're using the word because it's an accurate word and it's the most neutral. The if I want to show one slide to people that legitimizes this, because essentially MAPS Canada is bringing psychedelics into the mainstream. We are legalizing psychedelics. In order to legalize psychedelics, we have to get the mainstream of our culture to talk about it and to understand the benefits. Here's a slide of all the different universities that are publishing on the issue of psychedelics. And there's a ton of them, you know, Stanford, School of Medicine, Harvard Medical School, um, McMaster in Canada, Toronto, University of Toronto, um, King's College Lon London. Um, th there's a huge number of universities, Imperial College of London, who basically said, we would be missing the boat academically if we do not start looking into psychedelics. And here's the list of the ones that are so far publishing in that world. Now, if you really want to know what's going on in the world of research with psychedelics, you go into a, a very interesting website, and it's called clinicaltrials.gov. Anybody can access it. You can plug your plug that into your Google today and, and see, see what, what is being done in the world of psychedelics. So if you do search terms, if you plug up, if you if you enter that website, clinicaltrials.gov, and you add the word psychedelics, what you see is this page here, which is essentially in when I did this first search first in November 12th of 2019, I had 289 studies that were registered studies through academic institutions that had the word psychedelic in the title. Now, when I went a little later in May and I looked up that word, it had gone up to 298. When I use the search term psilocybin, what I get is 39 studies in November of 2019. And when I did that search again in February of 2020, the number had gone up to 43. When I looked for the word MDMA 
back in November, I found 76 studies and that had gone up to 79 in February. And when I plug in the word LSD, I, I found up 96 studies in November and in February, it would have gone up to 100. So what that tells you is there's a huge amount of research going on devoted to psychedelics and it's increasing rapidly. Every month that goes by, more people are registering studies. And it's fascinating just to flick down. If you actually wanna see what's going on, go into this website, flip down this list and see what people are actually doing and where people are at. Cause it'll tell you whether they've just started the study, whether they're accepting applicants. It will give you a huge amount of information about research that's going on all over the planet. So I wanna go back to understanding mainstream because for me the psychedelic renaissance the bringing back of psychedelics into popular culture started in 2010 with this new york times article it's, as you know the new york times is completely mainstream it's it's the leader the leading newspaper probably on the planet and certainly in north america and so what the new york times says is what influences others and the new york times back in April of 2010, said hallucinogens have doctors tuning in again. And it was a look at, look at the legitimacy of psychedelics. <clears throat> the New York Times Magazine in 2012 had how psychedelics drugs can help patients face death. Back to the New York, New York Times in 2014, can mushrooms treat depression? Looking at the John Hopkins work, um, treating depression with psilocybin. In terms of Canada, one of the major moments in bringing the psychedelic renaissance to mainstream Canadians was the Canadian Medical Association's journal's choice to put the psychedelic renaissance on its front cover. And they did that in 2015, which is absolutely huge. And they had two articles in there that were review articles, basically saying what's going on in the world of psychedelics. And this is the conservative voice of physicians across Canada. So when I'm talking to doctors, often I will just have a conversation with them. And in the background, I will share this image with them because this is their leadership. This is Canadian medical leadership saying, hey, we need to take a look at psychedelics. In terms of popular culture, Michael Pollan, who many of you know, is a, a very famous popular author who's written about food, you know, The Omnivore's Dilemma and, and many other books about food. And he had a huge following. And eventually, he decided to write about psychedelics. And he did a number of things in this book. First, he wrote a very readable book. He's, he's a fabulous author. Every once in a while when I read this book, I'd just stop and look at a sentence and go, that is a beautifully crafted sentence. Thank you, Michael. He also summarized, <coughs> he summarized the research beautifully. Um, he, he looked at what the academics are saying and he did it skillfully. And then he did something that most other authors don't do is he had his own experiences <coughs> Excuse me. And then he looked at the lens of science to try and understand his experiences. And he did it beautifully. He linked his own unconscious mind to what the science has told us about psychedelics. So when somebody asks me, you know, I want to know what you're doing, what do you do for a living, Mark? I say, read this book. And this is the book that I suggest. It's, it's incredibly engaging and very, very thoughtful. In terms of mainstream as well, Gwyneth Paltrow has a Goop series on Netflix. That's the name of her show is Goop. And it's all over the place. She explores many different healing topics. And she decided to explore psychedelics. And interestingly enough, she reached out to Canadians and she flew a bunch of us down to California and she stuck us on a video set and filmed us. And um, it was fascinating. So uh, it, was, it was a very interesting show. Um, I was amazed how many emails I've got as a result of this particular show. And I, th I think she did a good job. She actually showed psychedelic healing relatively well and she explored what it can do in a, in a way that is, from, from a mainstream media point of view, fairly decent. 
If you haven't seen the movie Dosed, I would strongly encourage it. Um, it's, a, uh, it's a movie about a Vancouver woman who had a massive heroin addiction. She was not doing well with her life, to say the least, and she decided to explore psychedelics to see if they could help her. And a, a bunch of filmmakers knew her personally, and they asked her if they could film her journey. And she said yes, and they followed her around through everything. And what I really like about this film is it's not simple. It really shows the complexity of the healing journey. It's not like you take a pill and you're fixed. You know, it really allowed her to embark on a journey of healing. And her journey of healing went well, and then it didn't go so well, and then it went well, and then it fell off the rails, then it got back on. So it, you really have a, a pretty visceral understanding of how psychedelics work if you see this film. And I, I appreciate it. And often Adrienne, who, who's the name of the woman who's the, the star of the show, the woman who was quite frankly healed with psychedelics, often shows up in theaters when it's being shown and answers questions. And, and Adrienne is doing just fine. It, it's very clear when you talk to her that psychedelics worked in, in this healing journey. For those folks who haven't seen the most recent Netflix version, it's called Have a Good Trip, Adventures in Psychedelics. T to be honest with you, I didn't like it, um, but it's mainstream and a lot of people have seen it. But it's it essentially is taking famous people from Ben Stiller to Sting to a variety of other folks, so famous people, and, and basically saying, what was your experience of psychedelics? And what they explore is either they had wonderful experiences or absolutely horrible experiences. <laughs> but what they missed with this show is they didn't talk about why people had bad experiences. So ideally, if I'd been making this movie, what I would have done is I would have put an indigenous person at the end who runs either peyote ceremonies or ayahuasca ceremonies, and I would have had them comment on the fact that Everybody that had a bad experience during this show, essentially it was all the same reason. It was lack of supervision. It was lack of context. It was a lack of thoughtful setting up of the experience and managing it skillfully, at, like indigenous people have been doing for centuries. It was, you know, people would take a dose of LSD and then decide to go out driving, which is a really, really, really bad idea. So, Essentially, all of the problems were created by the same thing, which is lack of skillful attention to set, which is the expectations of the environment, um, setting, which is where you're taking the substance, safety issues, like a careful attention to how are we going to keep this safe, and dosage, like knowing your dose and knowing how, how much you want to take and carefully managing how much you take of what substance. So set, setting, safety, and dosage issues comes down to me, the word being supervision. So these people were not supervised and some of them had horrible experiences and some of them had great experiences. So it's it's a mixed bag. It's entertaining, which I guess Netflix is always trying to be, but um, it is what it is. And so check it out. Now, if there was one media source that I think would be challenging us, it would be Fox News. Now, absolutely to my fascination, Fox News has been very fair to us. And the reason why is Fox News is very interested in veterans. Um, soldiers who all go off to war often come back with PTSD and they're damaged. And we are reaching out to soldiers and police and firefighters, first responders, and we're offering to heal them. And so far we've done a good job. And some of the most powerful spokespersons for us have been soldiers. And Fox News has noticed that. And so Fox News, believe it or not, is actually supporting what we do. Now, looking at psychedelics through the lens of researchers, there's three different groups of psychedelics. There's the classical psychedelics, which are LSD, mescaline, which is in peyote, psilocybin, which is in mushrooms, and DMT, which is dimethyltryptamine, which is one of the ingredients of ayahuasca. Now, what the classical psychedelics offer is a sense of spirituality, which is incredibly helpful um, for many things, both for connecting with one sense of spirituality, but in helping people to deal with, with problems in their lives. Sometimes if you adopt a spiritual perspective on a problem, the problem tends to become diminished. These, these medicines can be disorienting. They can be disorienting of the ego, which is actually quite helpful sometimes. And if you're drinking 40 ounces of vodka every single night and thinking it's okay, the belief system that believes that's okay needs to be shaken up a little bit. And the classical psychedelics will do that. The classical psychedelics un amplify unconscious material. 
essentially, we as a human species live our lives largely unconsciously. By what I mean by that is think about driving a car. You never think about your right foot when you're driving a car. What you tend to think about in your conscious mind is, you know, what's on the radio or lunch or the meeting you're about to have or the argument you just had with your spouse or whatever. That's what your conscious mind is doing. But your unconscious mind is driving the car. It knows when to put pressure on the accelerator and to move over to the brake because something's just come in front of the car. You never have to say, oh my gosh, there's a cat on the road in front of me. I need to move my right foot over to the brake and push down. That never happens. All of that happens with an unconscious tape loop. And we have access to those unconscious tape loops when psychedelics are skillfully used. The portal effect is another offering of a psychedelic experience. And the portal effect is what happens when you're experiencing something profound and, and tran a, a transition. So the portal effect happens at the end of high school, graduating university and climbing Mount Everest. The wow, that was incredible experience. And that can be very useful. If you're treating specific conditions, when you've had the experience and you go, wow, that was incredible. If a skilled therapist will then take that, wow, that was incredible. And how are you going to use that to change the issue in your life? And that's really helpful. Um, substance use disorder treatment, depression treatment, end of life anxiety treatment are all part of the process with classic, the classical psychedelics. And then there's a whole other group called the empathogens mostly, but sometimes intactogens. So empathogen means connection to others and intactogens means connection to self. And again, these are useful for reflection on self, but they're also very useful for reducing fear. So with PTSD treatment, often the unconscious tape loop that is problematic, you know, that I was at, a, I went to Iraq and I had all these bombs go off around me and all my friends got killed. And now when I'm back in North America and that unconscious tape loop plays over and over again. And that unconscious tape loop is encrusted with fear. So when normal treatments get close to it, there's a huge anxiety and fear response. That fear is reduced to allow the therapist and the subject to get in there and to work with that tape loop without a fear response. So example of empathogens are MDMA, methylene doxyamphetamine, or MDMA, methylene doxymethamphetamine, or 3MMC, which is 3-methylmethcathinone. There are a third group of psychedelics, which is basically everything else, and that's everything from ibogaine, which is useful for the treatment of addiction, specifically opiate addiction, ketamine, which is useful for the treatment of depression, 2CB, salvadormia, salvado, salvia divinorium, and they're useful for a variety of different indications. Stanislav Grof. If, if Albert Hoffman was the father of LSD, Stanislav Grof is the godfather of LSD. He's the one that's explored it most deeply and published most on it. And one of the things that he said is LSD is to the study of the mind, what the telescope is to astronomy, and the microscope is to biology. So I want to just explore some of the research that MAPS Canada is involved with. So our primary study is MDMA-assisted psychotherapy for post-traumatic stress disorder. And that started with this study. This was the beginning. So it was Michael and Annie Mithoffer publishing on their experience of doing therapy with, three M with, with MDMA with PTSD. And they demonstrated an 82% level of effectiveness in their treatment. And the normal effectiveness of PTSD treatment is somewhere between 10% is what the research says, or 25% is what the people who are trying to sell their treatments to the military. So it's somewhere in that window, sort of 10 to 25%. So 82% level of effectiveness is completely outrageous. Um, in fact, most scientists will look at that and say, you're falsifying your data, you're lying. Because most people who offer a treatment that is different from another treatment offer or talk about a one, two, three, or 4% improvement. So to go from 10 to 25% to 82% is, is virtually unparalleled in the research world. So to prove that Michael and Annie Mithoffer were not lying, what they had to do is they had to expand and they had to have oversight. So they did, they did a phase two clinical study. 
and they had oversight. In the United States, it was the, the oversight was the FDA. In Canada, the oversight was Health Canada, and they had access to everything. They had access to the all, all sessions were video recorded. They had access to the raw data, all the sheets that the subject filled out. They had access to everything. And so I want to show you the, the publishing, the, the, the data from the phase two study. So the comparator dose, the placebo dose, had proved to be 23% level of effectiveness, which is actually an interesting number because that's the high end of what anybody has ever claimed. So what that really says is the therapists were really, really good. With the folks who had two sessions of MDMA, at the two-month follow-up mark, they had demonstrated 55% level of effectiveness. At the two-month follow-up for three sessions of MDMA, it had gone up to 61% level of effectiveness. And to many researchers' amazement, it had gone up to 67.8% for all subjects at long-term follow-up, which is what that says is they continued to heal, which is actually quite unusual. How many medications do people take? And then six months later, they're better than when they originally took the medication. So this in itself is an absolutely fascinating slide. But what it also tells you is Michael and Annie Methoffer were not lying. No, they can teach other people to do this therapy and it's successful and it works. And Health Canada and the FDA looked at it and they accepted the data, which is huge. So for our phase two study, this is Canadian. So our phase two study, we completed our phase two with six people treated and two teams of therapies, therapists. And our phase three, which is now ongoing, we hope to treat 10 to 20 people with three teams of therapists. And we're working with an organization in Vancouver called the BCCSU, the British Columbia Center on Substance Use, who have graciously agreed to host our study. And the study is still led by the Americans, the MAPS USA folks. It's supported by MAPS Canada, and it's hosted by the BCCSU. So what we're doing is we are going to legalize MDMA. That's our track. Um, so. The Americans are already legalizing MDMA-assisted psych psychotherapy because they have a thing called the right to try legislation where they can ask for special permission to provide the service or the therapy outside of a phase three study. And the FDA granted them that. And so they are now rolling out legalization outside of their research. We can't do that because we don't have that legislation. In fact, we have some specific special access blocks in Canada. The psychedelics are listed as being something that they cannot give access to through this program. So we're working with our federal counterparts. That's one of my jobs is contacting and working with the federal folks who are actually being very receptive to us and um, and they're looking at how they can prevent that from being a block will be MDMA we believe will be legalized in about 2022 and then we will roll out clinics we won't own any clinics but we'll roll we will we will license and authorize therapists and people who own clinics um, across Canada and I'm already having people asking me how that can work and um, I'm telling them um, my concern of that whole process, and we can talk about that when we have our discussion, is the cost because we, we will be training licensed, trained, credentialed therapists within the context of um, licensed and accredited facilities. And it's going to be a lot of time, you know, two therapists, a male and a female. Um, that's an expensive process. And we can talk about what, what options there are around that. If you want to ask that question, when we have our discussion, I'd love to have a chat about that. We also are doing an eating disorder study. Now, I met with a funder who wanted to create the study, and, and we talked about eating disorders. And the root of eating disorders is five things. One is trauma. One is body dysmorphia, which is what you see in the mirror is not what other people see. Family conflict, you know, children needing to define themselves as separate from their families. Anxiety and society's image of women's bodies. Mostly women get eating disorders. Now, we believe that we can treat the top four of those. We can treat trauma, we know that. Body dysmorphia, that sounds like a yes. Family conflict, that's a yes. Anxiety, yes. We cannot change society. You know, Society's image of women's bodies is something we can't touch, but we can treat four of the five. So we believe that we can heal eating disorders. So we have three sites, Toronto, Vancouver, and Denver, and we've trained, hired and trained our therapists. And essentially, our goal is to 
increase the number of indications in the off-label window. Now, what, now what does that mean? It means any medication, any psychiatric medication that is proven to be useful is proven to be useful with a specific population. So, for example, if a, an antidepressant has come out, it, um, it will be proven to be effective with women between the ages of, let's say, 35 and 55. And sooner or later, some psychiatrist will prescribe it to a man and they'll find it works. And they'll prescribe it to a woman aged 65 and it works. And so when it's prescribed for men or women outside of the age range, that becomes off-label use. So we expect that initially MDMA will be used on-label, like for post-traumatic stress disorder in the context of very, very strict protocols. And then the more indications we can prove that it's useful for, the larger the size of the off-label window becomes. So, I mean, trauma is the root of everything, or it's the root of many other problems. It's the root of addictions, it's the root of many other concerns. And so slowly what we believe is that the, the population that gets treated with MDMA will expand. And the more indications we can prove that it's useful for, the larger the size the population will get. We also have another study. It's called Cognitive Processing Therapy for MDMA. Um, it's um, MDMA offered in the context of couples. Um, it's through Ryerson University. Now, one of the interesting meetings that I had recently was with the provincial government. The provincial government has decided that the psychedelic renaissance is alive and well. And I had a meeting with them asking a very simple question is how are we integrate, how are we going to integrate psychedelic treatments into the healthcare system? Oh, I was absolutely thrilled. I've been waiting for that invitation for that meeting for, all, for years. And, um, and one of the things that I went to them with was the the observation that psychedelics can reduce costs because we really that's what ministries are all about ministers are all about spending money how do we get the most healing for the least cost and so this is a, a graph that i've been working on so traditional psychoanalysis the cost of that is really expensive and my partner my life partner my love partner is a psychiatrist and so i asked her to do some um some costs in terms of when she she works in the context of the mainstream health care system. She works in the a community health care se setting. So I asked her, how much does it cost to manage somebody coming in with PTSD in your clinic? And she looked at the number of hours and she looked at the time frame and she did some math for me and she came up with a number. And then we looked at just the MDMA treatment protocol. You know, the MDMA treatment protocol is quite precise. You know, this is the number of hours involved. And we took those number of hours and we multiplied it by the number of a paid professional or two professionals in that context. And we came up with a number that was even more inexpensive. And then we came up with psychedelic therapy, which is essentially one therapist, not two. And then my long-term goal eventually is to actually run groups and provide psychedelic group experiences. Um, and the, that is the cheapest possible that you can do. So here is the slide that I haven't yet taken to the provincial government, but I certainly intend to. I want to just look at um, some of the research and just sh show you some of the images. Here's something by Dos Santos, the antidepressant, anxiolytic, anti-addictive effects of ayahuasca, psilocybin, LSD, a systematic review of clinical trials published in the last 25 years. And Dos Santos concluded that these psychedelic medicines are incredibly helpful. Here's um, psilocybin producing substantial and sustained decreases, decreases in depression and anxiety with people with life-threatening cancer. I used to work, my previous job was supervising an addictions team in the context of Vancouver Coastal Health, and we had a tobacco cessation program. And like all tobacco cessation programs, we weren't very effective. And here was a program that demonstrated an 80% level of effectiveness. It was a small number, it was um, 15 participants, but 12 of the 15 participants um, were abstinent from tobacco at the end of the study, which was absolutely amazing. Here's an alcohol proof of concept study, um, Michael Bogenschutz and some other folks looking at can alcohol, alcohol, alcoholism be treated with psilocybin? And the answer is a profound yes. Now what we found or what the researchers have found generally is 
the greatest predictor of a positive outcome is the degree to which a person experiences a mystical experience. So those folks who had a high degree of mystical experiences tended to have um, very successful treatment outcomes with the issues that they were looking at. So really understanding the relationship between mysticism and mystical and spiritual experiences and psychedelics is a crucial part of understanding the psychedelic experience. Now I'm going to show you a slide and I'm going to apologize. This is slide from hell. I, I, I acknowledge that, but the numbers are so important. I, I have to show this to you. So the number on the numbers on the right hand column are the 14th month follow up numbers. The column to the left of that under the number 30 is the 30 milligrams of psilocybin. And if you look at the positive attitudes to life, the top column, the numbers between the 30 column and the 14 month follow up column had gone up. That's also true with the positive attitudes towards self, positive mood changes, increased sense of spirituality, and how personally meaningful was this experience and how personally spiritual was this experience. All of those numbers went up 14 months later. Now, I can't think of any medicine that any doctor has ever given anybody that 14 months later it is more impactful than when you take the medicine. So this is one of the curious things about psychedelics. They seem to work this healing process that goes on throughout time which is absolutely fascinating. So everything that I've shown you so far is about carefully structured scientific use in you know carefully controlled environments but it's really interesting to ask the question, what happens when people use psychedelics in what are called naturalistic settings, like just your home? You know, people go buy psychedelics in their, you know, regular context and go home and use them. So there's been a couple of really big studies looking at naturalistic use. The first one was by Peter Hendricks looking at recidivism. Now, recidivism, as you know, is what ha whether people go back to jail after having been in jail. So how does the use of psychedelics change whether or not people go back to jail? Because when people go to jail, they're asked questions about their drug use patterns, and that is kept in the correctional database. So Peter Hendricks went into the correctional database and found 25,000 records. And he looked at the people who took psychedelics and the people who didn't and asked the question, do people who take psychedelics go back to jail? He also looked at things like stable family housing and employment. And yes, he found that stable family housing and employment were good predictors of low recidivism. So people who have those factors don't go back to jail very often. But what he found is that use of psychedelics was even more protective from recidivism from stable family, for stable family housing and employment, which is absolutely fascinating. So he was so interested in that database, he went into another database, and this was a huge one. This was the National Health Survey database in the United States, and there was 190,000 records that he looked at. And he said, how, does, how do psychedelics interact with psychological distress and spirituality, and no, and suicidality? And what he concluded was the use of psychedelics seemed to help people who are either suicidal or psychologically distressed. So that research got the attention of other researchers. And there was a, a local woman in Vancouver, Elena Argento, who looked at a very different population. She looked at um, marginalized women, women in our downtown east side, which is our most marginalized community. And she asked a very simple question is, how does the effect of psychedelics on these women's suicidality and opiate use. Um, and she found that the use of psychedelics is helpful in this population, which is absolutely fascinating. Here's another one looking at 5-MeO-DMT um, in, again, naturalistic settings, and it's associated with unintended improvements in depression and anxiety. So people who smoked at DMT in whatever settings, just home, home use, and um, they seem to be mentally healthier having done that experience. This particular study I like to share just because I really like the title. It's so cool. The efficacy, tolerability, and safety of serotonogic psychedelics for the management of mood, anxiety, and substance use disorders, a systematic review of systematic reviews. I just, I think, that is a beautiful title. And what Dos Santos 
concluded after a massive deep dive in the world of psychedelic literature is these are helpful medicines. So I want to talk about a little project I'm working on because most people, most researchers and most people generally believe that if you have schizophrenia and you take psychedelics, um, it will be destabilizing. That particular combination of schizophrenia and psychedelics is a really bad combination. But I had a man approach me who has schizophrenia and he found over a long period of time that if he microdose, he took a very, very small dose of either LSD or psilocybin, his voices that he hears, he has voices in his heads that aren't him, they're something else, they're aliens. The voices normally um, are violent voices. They're condemning, hostile, aggressive, and judgmental. And with a very, very small dose of a psychedelic, the voices change and they become loving, positive, spiritual, and even wise. So I wanted to know if this was the only experience on the planet of that. And so I did a deep dive in the literature. And mostly what I found is if you have schizophrenia and you take a psychedelic, you become destabilized. But that's with large dosages. Nobody, or at least almost nobody, was looking at tiny dosages until I found this paper. And so this was a paper that was published in 1958. And it was a mental hospital that had a social group with people with schizophrenia and they would bring them together every day and just kind of pay them to hang out with each other. And what they found is people in this group generally either wouldn't talk, they'd sit there in silence, they would talk, but they wouldn't talk in relationship to what anybody else was saying. They would just talk individually with no contact with each other. And they gave them a very, very small dose of LSD. And the people that weren't talking before started to talk and they started to have a conversation. They talked together, which I find absolutely fascinating. So I'd like to do a survey. One of my projects um, is a survey, and we, we'd like to um, find out if anybody else is um, is having this experience. And, and we're going to publish his story. I've written up his story, and it's almost ready. And we're going to stick it on our website, and anybody can read it. And so I'll get the word out there. This may be something that people want to think about, especially if you have schizophrenia, because my partner, as I said, who's a psychiatrist, observes to me that the treatment, for current treatments for schizophrenia have really, really unfortunate side effects. They're really, they don't work very well. They're very sedating and the side effects are really unpleasant. So if there's anything out there better for the treatment of schizophrenia, I think that we owe it to this particular population to find it. There was another study that was done by Petrie et al. Um, and this is the publication of it. But in that study, they came up with an image. And here's the image. And the image is, um, it's of the human brain, normal and on psilocybin. So what you see on the left-hand circle that you're looking at is the, the human brain has different parts. So let's say the purple thing at the top is the visual cortex. So the visual cortex talks a lot to the visual cortex, but it really doesn't talk with any other part of the brain. The image on the right is what happens under the influence of psychedelics. And what you see is a whole lot of new connections get formed, which is absolutely fascinating and may wind up being one of the reasons why psychedelics are so effective in the treatment of a whole variety of different disorders. So this is a really helpful image to help us to understand why these treatments are so effective. Another project I'm working on is I'd like to write a manual for psychedelic guides. Well, I have written a manual for psychedelic guides and I'd like to publish it and make it available for people because really nobody have, has written a how-to manual. Underground therapists have written about what they do and they've sort of said, you know, this is, this is what happened to me and they tell lots of stories. Um, the research protocols talk about how you do psychedelic psychotherapy, but they never talk about any of the juicy stuff. They never talk about what you do when things go wrong because it's not written for therapists. It's written for ethics review boards. So because nobody's actually said, this is how you do the work, I would like to make it available. So I've written it and we're, we're about to publish it. Stay tuned. It will be available. So here is an image of what happens during psychedelic psychotherapy. Now, this is myself and my partner, and quite frankly, a huge muscular guy with lots of tattoos who I know from the gym. And I asked him if he would play the role. So we set up this image to take this shot. It's not a real therapy session, but it gives you a sense of how psychedelic psychotherapy works. You know, the person lying down is is has blindfold on and has and listening to music it's headphones there's a connection happening between him and the therapist my he's holding my hand there's a male and a th female therapist in the room 
curious enough, just in front of my my face, there's a bunch of roses. Roses is a is a very old tradition, having fresh roses in the room and then showing the subject a, a rose towards the end of the experience is part of it. And there's also a variety of kind of um, spiritual kind of images. I have a few Buddhas and and various spiritual um, images in the room. So this is this is really what we're talking about when we're talking about psychedelic psychotherapy. We're talking internal mostly, internal by, by that mean blindfold on and, and headphones, but the ability to be incredibly engaged and external when appropriate. So um, when I went to the Ministry of Health provincially and talked to them about psychedelics and they asked me the question, how do we integrate these things into the healthcare system? I talked about clinic-based treatments for post-traumatic stress disorders, addictions, depression, and anxiety. I suggested that they might want to start in addiction treatment facilities because um, it, it would be a very safe environment to be doing it. I talked about both microdosing and large dosing, very small and very big dosing. And we talked about the challenges because there's a huge difference between psychedelic and conventional treatments. And we really need to, to work with specialists. If, if we have somebody that comes along, a psychiatrist that just thinks it's a drug like an antidepressant, we will not be effective at treat, treating people. So we really need to have specialists working in this field. If you're interested, I've written a paper on how I believe psychedelics should be legalized, which is not my MAPS Canada hat, I have a public health hat as well. So in my public health view of the world, I offer a regulation model of, of psychedelics. And we can talk about what that actually looks like if you'd like. The future of psychedelics. I believe that psychedelics in the future will be useful. And they'll be useful for the treatment of addictions, for the treatment of mental health concerns, and for helping people to access a sense of spirituality. And it's whatever spirituality that they believe in. Christians will find Christ, Buddhists will find the Buddha, agnostics will find the universe. So it's not a, it's not a specific spirituality. Psychedelics can illuminate and add a spiritual experience to any organized religion. And what I'm really interested in thinking about these days is psychedelics can help people connect with each other. And so the book that I'm reading now, which is available on Amazon, is called Love Drugs and the Chemical Future of Relationships. And they do a deep dive into trying to understand how psychedelics can be useful for bonding people to each other, bonding communities, bonding loved ones, bonding family members to each other. And I think that's a piece of the, the work that we really haven't really even started to explore is how psychedelics can be incredibly helpful for people connecting to each other. And different psychedelics connect people in different ways. And if you want to ask me about that, let's have that conversation. So the future looks like this. We're going to open psychedelic psychotherapy clinics. We're going to offer them in urban settings and we're going to offer them in rural settings. One does not discover new lands without consenting to lose sight of the shore for a long period of time. And the saddest aspect of life now is that science gathers knowledge faster than society gathers wisdom. Thank you. Let's have a conversation. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Mark, for all of the amazing information. You're welcome, Shannon. It's my pleasure. <laughs> all right. Do you want to take a, should we take a five minute break here and Absolutely. then come back right at four o'clock? Yes, and please let's uh, people ask questions. Let's let's have a conversation about this. Hopefully, I've thrown up enough controversial thoughts that people will have many ideas, and we have time. Let's play. Thank you, Shannon. Wonderful. Back in a flash. Yes. So many great questions. So for those of you watching, uh, please vote up your questions in the ask a question box below, and we will be back in five minutes. Thank you so much.
All right, welcome back everyone. We're just waiting for Mark Hayden here and then we'll get started in our Q&A. So just a quick reminder, if you have any questions, please submit them at the bottom of the screen and we will be um, answering those there. So we have Mark back. Welcome, Mark. Thanks again, everyone, for joining us on this webinar, our first one of the 14 episodes of the series. We're going to start with a brief Q&A and then at about quarter after, we have another special guest joining us today, Paul Manley. We'll be bringing him on screen here with us as well. So Mark, we have a lot of questions here for you, actually 38 okay. in the <laughs> ask good. a question. And then we have a lot that were submitted as well via email and online. So let's start with the one that's voted up the most here on the screen in uh, Crowdcast. So the question is, are there training programs for mental health professionals to assist with psychedelic therapy? And the answer is yes, but within the context of our research, because our first goal is to legalize psychedelics. So there's no point in training people outside of our research because they wouldn't be offering the experience legally. And so we want to, our, we have an agenda and our agenda is legalize psychedelics. So we are trained therapists within our context of our legal therapy. As soon as we legalize it, and this is the second question. So the timeline for legalizing it is about 2022. So that's when we believe that we'll give our data to Health Canada and they'll look at it and then we will have crossed all of the boxes or ticked all the boxes and crossed all of the T's and we will have done everything that Health Canada requests of us to produce a legal medicine. And then we will start to roll out legalized psychedelic treatments across Canada. Well, and at that well. point, at that point, we'll be training therapists. Um, we will, we'll, it's, it's interesting to look at who will be training because we don't yet know. We know that the American FDA has asked the MAPS USA to increase the credentialing that's required because they, the, the therapist didn't have to be an MD or a PhD in the, ther in the research. But the FDA is asking for either... Uh, an MD or a PhD to be leading the therapeutic process, which actually doesn't make sense because often, you know, if you if you have a PhD in in psychology, often you're more interested in research. There's a lot of really skillful masters trained therapists who are would be completely appropriate to our work. More credentialing doesn't mean more skill in our in our case. In fact, one of the things that we found is training people is that. There's a process of teaching people how to do psychedelic psychotherapy that involves new information, but there's a huge amount of unlearning that has to do. Um, very, very experienced therapists need to stop doing a lot of what they've done historically if they're going to be effective in the world of psychedelics. Wonderful. Thanks, Mark. So the second question that we have uh, comes from email. And it is so many people are concerned about the cost of psychedelic therapy once medicalized. What is being done to make it more accessible? And will it ever be covered by universal health care? And there's actually a second part to this question. And it's what is MAPS doing to make sure that MDMA therapy will be accessible and affordable to everyone who needs it? Well, let's kind of pick away at those questions one at a time. So yes, mm -hmm. initially, cost will be an ex a challenge. And so, you know, it depends on how Health Canada requires us to roll it out and depends on the credentialing of the people. So the, the initial experience will be probably quite expensive. And we hope that what will happen is psychedelic therapies will become legitimized. And so as it becomes legitimized, we hope that it will be used off label. So not according to the exact way it was done originally during the research. So off label use would be with one therapist, not two. Now one therapist would be half the cost. Another way of making it less expensive is to provide the experience in groups. 
and I would love to do research on groups and to, to provide those experiences because, again, that would reduce the cost. But I'm also interested, I, 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 you can go and read my paper that I've written on how psychedelics should be legalized because while I agree with everything I've just said, I also think there's something else because I, I proposed a model of regulation in as I was writing this paper on how psychedelics should be legalized, I, I proposed a model of regulation that's all about psychedelic supervision and having a trained professional group of people who would have oversight over the psychedelic experience. And inevitably, somebody would stand up at the back of the audience and raise up their hand and say, I object. And they would always say the same thing. What they would say is, I love psychedelics. And what I do with my loving partner under the influence of a psychedelic, I do not want supervised. And you know something, I think they had a point because psychedelics can be incredibly helpful in the context of loving couples and relationships and bonding friends together. So the model that we came up with eventually after quite a bit of back and forth was there should be two tiers. Tier number one is trained professionals that should be able to diagnose and treat specific mental health disorders. And if you want to pay for the service, you can, and the trade professional would receive, would, would be able to offer that service for, 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 for money. But if you just want to do psychedelics with your loving partners or friends, you should be able to purchase them and not be supervised. But then if you look at videos like the new Netflix video, what you can see is people don't use psychedelics skillfully right now because we don't have a long historical indigenous experience that were rather wise elders and leaderships show younger people how to do these experiences wisely. And so what you get is really, really unskilled people who are working with powerful medicines and doing harm. So it is reasonable to ask somebody who wants to purchase a psychedelic to take a two weekend training course. The weekend number one is knowledge. You know, what is 100 mics of LSD going to do to you? What is three grams of psilocybin mushrooms going to do? So it's a knowledge based thing. What does set mean? What does setting mean? What does safety mean? How do you structure these experiences in a safe way? How soon after taking a psychedelic can you drive? So it would be a knowledge-based filled weekend. And the second weekend will be an experience. And it will be with a trained professional who knows how to carefully screen and set people up for the experience and demonstrate a skillfully run psychedelic experience. And then there'll be a questionnaire. People should have acquired some knowledge now. You know, what is 500 micrograms of LSD gonna do to you? How disoriented will your ego be? So some really basic questions about set, setting, safety, and dosage issues. And if people have the knowledge, then they'll be granted a certificate and a card that will allow them to go in and buy enough psychedelics for their own personal use and maybe a few friends. And that would be making them as accessible as possible. Perfect. Thank you, Mark. So are we clear to say that there are plans to have psychedelic therapy available to healthy normals? Or will these therapies be available just for people um, suffering with mental health issues? Well, you, you can't legalize psychedelics unless you treat a diagnosis. So all of the research being done today, that's, the, that's not true. All of the research that we are doing today is about trying to treat a diagnosis. And many other research groups are either looking at anxiety or depression or addiction issues or PTSD. It's all about a diagnosis. And the reason why that is, is you can't legalize a medicine unless the medicine is treating a diagnosis. It's that simple. So the beginning is to provide it within a legal context for specific diagnoses. And then we, what we're actually doing is we're bringing it into mainstream. We're bringing psychedelic medicines to the mainstream. And we intend to have lots of positive media attention and slowly people's opinions will shift. And it will no longer be big, scary, taboo, horrible, nasty drugs and whatever people, all the taboo things that people do through the lens of prohibition. We'll start to repetitively talk about psychedelic medicines and then they'll be used initially with a diagnosis and then off label for a wider range of diagnoses. And then eventually as public opinion changes, we hope to be able to treat healthy normals. As treat is the wrong word. Um, we are able to allow healthy normals to have a spiritual or mystical experience and quite frankly, connect with their loved ones. 
Perfect, thank you. And speaking about the mystical experience, the next question we have here on Crowdcast um, says, does MAPS Canada have interest in exploring and researching the spiritual aspects of psychedelics? The short answer is it depends on money. If somebody came down the pipe and offered me the huge amount of money, millions, that would be required to do that research, absolutely we would do that research. But right now we have a single focus, which is to legalize psychedelics. That's our goal. And so doing spiritual research doesn't help legalize psychedelics because it's not treating a diagnosis. So we need to find diagnoses and we need to treat them and then we need to open clinics across Canada and we need to engage the media around what we're doing and we need, that's, that's the path of legalization. In regards to research and fundraising millions of dollars, why do we need to fundraise for research? Ah, I like the question. Thank you. Um, yeah, research, if you're doing legitimate legal research through university ethics review boards that has oversight of Health Canada is incredibly expensive. And that is the vehicle to turning a molecule into a medicine. Any pharmaceutical company that produces a prescription drug that you've taken has gone through that process. And we are required to go through exactly the same process and that's what we're doing. And that costs a lot of money and that's why we're constantly fundraising. Perfect. Thanks, Mark. And on the topic of research, in the foreseeable future, will MAPS Canada do any research on the potential benefits of DMT? It's interesting. I'm not personally interested in DMT. I'm always, you know, keeping my ears or fingers, whatever it is, to the grapevine of what people are actually experiencing in community. I'm personally much more interested in 5-MeO-DMT, 5-methoxy-dimethyltryptamine. Um, I think that it's, I mean, DMT when people talk about it, uh, many people I'm sure will challenge me here, but when people talk about their DMT experiences, they tend to talk about how otherworldly it is and they've met the sh machine elves and you meet other aliens and all this kind of interesting stuff, but it's not therapeutic. You know, when I talk to people who've taken 5-MeO DMT, they have access to their unconscious minds. They explore who they are in a deep and profound way and often change behaviors that are really problematic for them. So for me, I'm more interested in 5-MeO DMT than I am DMT. If somebody gave me a couple of million bucks and said, do something related to something related to DMT, I would say 5-MeO is the one to explore. Right. Now we have a couple of questions here in regards to getting involved with MAPS. So the one on Crowdcast says, are there any ways to get involved with MAPS, Map, MAPS Canada anywhere else in Canada aside from BC? And the other question is, how do we get involved with MAPS Canada? Thank you. Love the question. Yeah, MAPS Canada has support groups across Canada because we're MAPS Canada. We're not MAPS Vancouver. So I have probably a dozen support groups in different cities across Canada. And if somebody wants to start a support group um, and would like to reach out to, you know, their professionals, their psychiatrists and their psychologists within their communities, because we're going to be asking people to open clinics and we're going to be training therapists. So you may as well start now, like reach out to your community of people that would be interested in opening those kind of clinics. Start Start to understand what the research says, start to la ta learn how the language of talking about this. Um, it's interesting, I had, um, I, I had one person at one city across Canada who said, yes, but what would happen if the police found out I was opening the support group? And my answer was, invite the police. We want to train, we want to not train, we want to treat police officers with PTSD. We want to treat first responders. We want to treat the military. That's who you invite to the room. These are the people who want to have as spokespeople and who are understanding what we're doing. You know, I, I, I talk to police. We have police members that are really supportive of what we're doing. We have fire members of fire responders. We have a number of, we, in fact, we have ambulance responders as well. We have first responders from all the different three first responder groups in MAPS Canada helping us. We also have an RCMP officer who's um, keenly interested in what we're doing. So uh, reach, reach out to either existing support groups that exist in your city or just create one. Talk to me. Michael Oliver, who is my assistant and my volunteer coordinator, will kind of give you the formula of how you do it. And um, just remember, we're a legal research organization, and that's what we talk about. We don't advocate for anything illegal. We don't talk about illegal behavior. We're just a legal research organization, and we're going to be opening clinics across Canada or training therapists across Canada. And anybody who wants to participate in that discussion should have a support group in your city. Our biggest support group is probably 
Actually, we have a number of them, but we have a big one in Toronto. We have one in Kingston, Ontario. We have one in Halifax. Um, we have one in um, Edmonton in, in Alberta and other ones across Canada. So either consider opening a support group in your community. And that just means reaching out to professionals in your community saying, hey, let's talk about this. Let's look at this, read Michael Pollan's book together, get together and talk about what we understood. I also collect and organize the research. Um, because I think it's important that people have access to the science and it's in a Dropbox and anybody can ask me for it. I'll send you the link and you can go do a deep dive and actually see what people are publishing. And so anybody that ran a support group, I'd encourage them to get the link to my Dropbox and go in and just when new research comes down the pipe, it'll be added to the Dropbox and just send it out to your community and say, hey, look at this study. And uh, what do you think about this one? And there's been a, a couple of very recent huge literature reviews, one specifically focusing on LSD and one on all psychedelics that really in a broad analysis of what's happening in a very beautiful way. And so, you know, taking those papers and looking at them and reading them in a group is exactly what we need to be doing. Great, I think we have time for one more quick question here. Uh, before we bring on Paul. And the last question is from Nico on Instagram, and it's what administrative steps would you recommend a Canadian grad student interested in studying psychedelics to take, event to, take to eventually conduct experiential studies? I, I missed a couple of words there. Can you read the first part of that again? So what administrative and legal steps gotcha, would you recommend? Gotcha, gotcha, okay. Um, I mean, I get asked similar questions. You know, how do I get involved? I, I'm going to just, you know, if, if you're an academic and you, you know, want to study this and you want to participate in this world in the future, I, I don't have one answer, but certainly, you know, I, credentials help, you know, having a degree in psychology would help, having a degree in psychiatry would help, um, you know, social workers, you know, psychologists who work with between the ears and psychiatrists who manage medications, social workers who work with groups and families and do therapy in groups and families um, would help, so clinical social work. Um, those are the kind of degrees that I would be thinking about if I wanted to be an eventual psychedelic psychotherapist. Um, but there's lots of other ways of, you know, people, maybe you're a neuroscientist and you just want to do brain chemistry work. You don't want, or brain neuron work. You don't want to actually talk to people. You just want to understand what's going on in the brain. That door is also wide open. Um, if you want to be a clinic administrator, I have a lot of people who run health clinics saying, how do I get involved? And well, you're a health clinic administrator and um, you can start looking at the construction of the walls. You know, how do you set up a clinic? You know, what, what, how do you make soundproof walls? How do you uh, how do you set up a clinic that it would be appropriate for psychedelic psychotherapy? You need close access to a washroom, soundproof rules and soundproof walls, and no overhead lights are the three criteria. So how do you set that up? And you know, I have some thoughts about that. So many different people can participate in this. Wonderful, thanks, Mark. We have a whole list of questions left to go, but it's time to bring on Paul. So we are going to welcome our special guest, Paul Manley. Paul is a member of parliament for Nanaimo and Lady Smith, and he's joining us today to briefly talk about the decriminalized nature petition, which most of you have probably heard of that's going around. Paul is one of the men behind this petition to decriminalize psychedelics, and we'll be bringing it to parliament. And I know, Mark, you have a few questions here for Paul as well. So welcome, Paul. Well, thanks for having me. This is great. I was, I've been listening in all along here as I'm uh, working away. So Wonderful. Thanks for joining us. I think we still have Mark here. So Mark, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Wonderful. Did you want to go ahead with your questions for Paul? So Paul, yes, I, I would love to know, you know, my, my conversations with Ottawa politicians generally is they're surprisingly knowledgeable, but they never speak about issues that are relevant to these kind of topics. Um, politicians also, I mean, for example, I, I talked to a, a senator once who said that him and his colleagues were acutely aware that prohibition didn't work and it was a miserable social failure and a huge, huge expense to Canadians. There was a failed social experiment and they were completely unwilling to talk about it because they didn't believe that there was any political will for them to do so it would they wouldn't win politically mm -hmm. by talking about it so they they had the evidence they had the knowledge and what they actually said in public was completely opposite of what they personally believed so as you 
cruise around Ottawa and talk to people, does the issue of psychedelics ever come up? And what, what kind of conversations do you have with people? Uh, no, it doesn't. So, <laughs> you know, I haven't talked to other MPs about this petition aside from my own caucus, just to give them a heads up that I was, uh, that I was going to sponsor it and that I would like to see uh, psychedelics legalized, that I'd like to see other drugs legalized. And I want to, and, and it's actually Green Party policy that we end the war on drugs and, um, you know, have a, a rational approach to, to, um, to drugs as a, as a health issue, um, you know, as a social issue. And so um, I know uh, Nathaniel Erskine Smith has put forward a, a private member's bill to decriminalize all drugs. And I will definitely support that. Um, I, you know, just from what I know about the, the war on drugs, it's a failure and I don't mind saying that out loud. Um, so I, I'll, I'll be having more of those conversations with uh, other politicians, I'm sure, coming up. Yes. Yeah. So I'd be, I'd be curious on your personal opinion because there's multiple tracks to legalize psychedelics. There's the main track that we're on, the stage one, two, and three clinical trial, which is going through Health Canada and turning a molecule into a medicine and, and then have it available through prescription. That's one track. But there are other tracks. As you probably know, um, the, there are many municipalities in the United States that have decriminalized either plant or fungus-based psychedelics and then there's the Oregon Psilocybin Services an issue, which is full legalization that hopefully will be on the ballot at the next federal election. So those are three completely different tracks. I would be curious to know what your opinion of those three tracks are. Well, first of all, uh, I think that any indigenous traditional use of plant-based medicines should be completely legal. And so, you know, there we're, there are traditions that go back thousands of years using uh, different plant-based medicines and for cultural healing uh, and traditional purposes. And, and that needs to be legal for, you know, straight up because the criminalization of uh, other people's cultures is highly problematic. And it's a, you know, part of our colonial, uh, the colonial attitude and, and legacy that we need to unwind. Um, in terms of, um, decriminalizing drugs look we have an opioid crisis right now and so we need a safe supply for people who are addicted and we need a way for people to to deal with their addictions and you know i watched that movie dose uh, i thought that was a a great film i didn't know anything about uh iboga before that um but i, I thought that was very educational I've known for a long time that people have used psychedelics to deal with addiction issues, with with uh, cocaine, with alcohol, with tobacco, with uh, with other things. So, I've I've known about this for a long time, and I think that it's it's um, you know long overdue. Um, Ken Tupper, by the way, used to be my wife's roommate way back. Oh, uh, yeah. So. <laughs> Oh, good. Uh, in in the late '90s, so those were in the beginning days when he was was just doing, you know, starting his studies on ayahuasca and doing his yes. PhD. And um, you know, one of the things that I I feel about about legalization and decriminalizing is that we don't we've seen how how um, this indigenous knowledge has been used by pharmaceutical country, companies in the past, where they'll come and they'll take that knowledge and but they disrespect the cultures and traditions that are attached to it. And I would not like to see that happen in the case of, of uh, psychedelics as well, because I think that it's really important to honor those honor and respect those traditions. Thank you. Um, yeah. So there, you know, there's, there's different paths on this. And I, I know listening to this discussion, uh, you know, talking about people having good trips or bad trips and the, you know, the setting and the intention and, and how people, uh, use these drugs. They're not for fooling around with. Um, oh, people, they're, powerful. they're very powerful. And, uh, you know, just what I learned about Ayaboga, just watching that film, uh, that's, you know, not something that people should be, should be messing around with. And, and I think, you know, the same with, with all of these things. So <clears throat> it's, it's a matter of, um, ensuring that, that legalization, comes with education and and comes with a, a way to ensure that people um you know 
don't do stupid things like yeah. like take hallucinogens and then drive. Yes. Uh, yeah. And and you know those kind of things would seem kind of obvious um, based on our understanding of drinking and driving, but yeah, um, maybe not obvious all the time. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I really appreciate right. that, and your willingness to speak out on drug policy issues generally is noticed and appreciated. Thank you. Well, thank thank you. I mean, I I. Uh, I got elected for a bunch of different reasons, and one of those is to, to, you know, I wanted to be elected so I could speak my mind and and uh, work on issues that are important. And I think this is an important issue. We have a mental health crisis, we have an addiction crisis in this country, and we need to to work on different ways of, of uh, helping people, you know, yes. deal with those things. In my writing, um, I was surprised because I went to Sal Salvation Botanicals to their lab. To, and they, they do research on cannabis, and then I found out that they were doing, uh, uh, um, well, they do not research, but they do um, uh, testing you yes. know, for contaminants, and they do that for psilocybin as well. And then they were talking about <clears throat> the trials that are going on, and I just thought that was, you know, really interesting and interesting to have happening in, in my riding yes. uh, right here. So, yes. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Well, thank, thank you. you. Paul, as you know, at MAPS Canada, we support your petition. Is there anything else that you wanted to say while you're here about petition E2534? Uh, just, you know, for people to share it, share it out, out there openly and get as many signatures as you can on it. And uh, it gives me an opportunity to stand up in the House of Commons. Uh, it's difficult to do paper petitions at this time right now. Um, E-petitions you know, you get you get that one shot, and you can have thousands of of signatures on it with a paper petition. All I need is twenty five signatures on a piece of paper, and I can table that in the House of Commons. But it's we're you know in the COVID nineteen crisis right now, nobody's passing their own paper paper yeah. petitions to fill out for me. But um, I think you know the process that Maps Canada is doing to educate people uh, about this and to share information is super important. Getting out there in front of the public. And, and educating people, educating pol politicians. Uh, the more people know, the less fear there is, the, the less uh, ignorance there is about these things, and, and uh, the more likely we're going to be able to move forward with it. Great, thank you. Thank you that was actually one of the questions that came in here in regards to um, the government, and was what can we do as citizens to help the government change the current status of psychedelic plant medicines? Well, you can, you know, you can write to government ministers. Uh, and so letter writing campaigns, petitioning, uh, educating people. Um, the e-petitions, you know, when th these other petitions that you see on, on different sites, like um, they don't actually have any effect. They send an email to whoever's targeted on that petition. And those go into a folder that's set up automatically to you know, to gather those signatures or whatever. But the the e-petition, the government actually has to respond to, and it's part of a legal process uh, in the House of Commons. And so that's a good way of, of uh, bringing attention to it. Puts it on the record. How many people signed that petition? How many people are asking for these things? Wow. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Mark, do you have anything else for Paul before we uh, close up the webinar here? Well, I'm kind of interested in playing with one of the questions that's popped up, which is the restorative justice question. So do we have a moment just to play with that question for a second? Sure. So, I mean, the question is, um, do you think psychedelics could be integrated in a restorative justice model of Canada? And I've always liked restorative justice. So it's like bringing communities together and solving problems as opposed to just targeting the bad guy and throwing him in jail. And one of the things that I know is psychedelics are incredibly helpful as bonding agents and, and helping people to speak the truth to each other if set up well. So I think psychedelics have a huge role to play in restorative justice. Paul, if you'd love to comment on that, I'd love to know what you I hadn't think. Actually, I hadn't actually thought of that before, but I think that... Uh, but that, you know, like you were saying, it 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 helps people to be be clear with their thoughts and to be honest about about their feelings, and uh, it's kind of like a truth truth serum in a way. I don't know. Yes. That yeah. uh, gets people to have a, an open, honest conversation. Exactly. Yeah, and and uh, it could be good for helping people break down 
you know, barriers that they're, that they're dealing yeah. with that, Absolutely. that have brought them to those places. I think one of the things that we'll do as time goes on is we'll kind of come up with different psychedelics for different indications socially. I mean, for restorative justice, I would think that something like either a powerful classic like a psilocybin where people go and have a spiritual experience then come back and talk about it probably not so much mdma because you don't really don't want people crawling across the room wanting to hug each other but something like 3mmc where it's conversational and people do feel a good sense of connection but they want to talk about it so something like psilocybin lsd or 3mmc would probably be the ideal medicines to be working with social justice around yeah, interesting yeah. just playing with thoughts here yeah Mm -hmm. I hadn't, yeah, I hadn't really thought about, yeah. about those kind of applications. I'm, but Paul, I'm I just want to appreciate the, the political realm here. Like, just yes, uh, I'm, I'm listening to what the researchers are saying, and uh, and you know, um, I've I've followed what Wade Davis has been doing for a long time, and Gabor Mate, and yes, uh, yes, and you know, uh, I haven't seen Ken in ages, but uh, yeah, I'll, I'll I'll say hello. Way, way way back about these things, and so uh, you know. The, I'm interested in what the experts are doing, and I, I really appreciate these the st these studies being done and and pushing that an envelope with the clinical trials and uh, yes. educating you know politicians, edu educating other uh, medical practitioners about this and yes. the importance of. So the bottom line, Paul, is we need each other. I yeah. need you because I need politicians who are willing to speak about this issue. And you need me because you need informed people who understand the subject matter and yeah. can and can do the educational piece. So we need the political people. We need medical communities. We need psychiatrists, psychologists. Social, we need everybody to talk about this. So thank you for your willingness to speak about this. Noticed and appreciated. All right. Evidence-based decision-making. That's uh, what a, a, concept. Green, a green party. Uh, <laughs> yeah. 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 Yes. Platform, platform. It's one of the, one of the uh, foundations yeah. of yes. how we make decisions. Thank you. All right. Well, great talking to you, Mark. Okay. Yeah. And thanks for having me on, Shannon. Yeah. Thanks so much for joining us, Paul. And thanks so much, Mark. So if you have any final words, Mark, um, you can say those now and I'll close up the webinar. Sure, MAPS Canada is the people that show up. And MAPS Canada is a national organization with a whole lot of people. If you wanna get involved, we would love to embrace you into the MAPS Canada fold. Um, email Michael Oliver and, and tell him what you have to offer. Participate in your community wherever you are. Um, get the word out there. We are going to legalize psychedelics and we need a whole lot of people across Canada to help us. So thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Mark. So a few other thank yous I'm going to add here just as we wrap up. I want to thank our guests, Mark Hayden and Paul Manley. Thank you to the rest of the speakers that we have lined up for supporting this important research and giving their time to be here with us. Thank you to our sponsors who, step, who have stepped up even during a pandemic to help out and share their support. Thank you to Michael Oliver, who has co-organized this event and put in an enormous amount of effort. Thank you to the MAPS Canada volunteers who are working diligently on the back end of this series, making sure that there are no technical glitches and that we stream through to you clearly. And very importantly, thank you to all of you for being here to support this series, the speakers, and this important research. So up and coming, our next episode will be on June 2nd with plant healer and shaman Nan Shuni Giron from Guatemala. So make sure that you submit your questions for her, for her in advance. And our full lineup can be viewed on the webpage at mapscanada.org forward slash webinar. We have 13 episodes remaining, and if you haven't purchased the series and would like to, we have it priced to be fair and affordable in hopes of still raising money for this important research. So thank you again for attending, and we